Today's tutorial is going to be using version 0.12 of RayTK. Um, so go to the download link in the description and download the Tox file here, and then drop that into your project. And you'll notice that in uh, 0.12 um, it has this help image just in case you forget what the shortcut is to open up the palette for creating new ops. So I'm going to start by hitting Alt-R to create our first op, um, which is going to be a box SDF. Now I'm going to create a Raymarch renderer and there's now a shortcut in the palette where it'll where you can type in kind of the the initials of the word that you're looking for so I if I just type in rr3 then that gets you to the raymarch renderer 3d connect that first input to the box and add a null at the end so we can see what's coming out of there now I'm going to split the pane so that we can see what's going on in that rendering while working on the network a little bit more easily. So I'm going to switch to top viewer on that and set the display flag on this null here. And then I'm going to turn off the background tops in the network editor. So now we've got our basic um, scene pipeline set up going to add a camera. So we're going to use look at camera. So, so LAC, paste that in, connect that to the second input here. And you'll notice that the bug from the previous version that where it didn't always recognize that connection has been fixed now. So you don't have to do any kind of work around to get that to be recognized. Uh, it should just work going to also add a point light and connect that to the third input here, the light input, and move the location up a little bit in the Y and then maybe look back and see off the side a little bit in the X. Okay. So now that we have our box, I'm going to I want to add um, some kind of bulging shapes around each corner of the box. So I'm going to start with a sphere. And I'm just going to connect that up here instead, just so we can see that uh, on its own for a minute. Now, what we currently have is one sphere centered in the middle of the um, coordinate space. So the mirror octant operator is good for splitting space along two axes and spreading it out. So you can already see there that the um, that it's made kind of four copies of that in space there, and then so that gets us kind of two axes worth of squares and now I'm going to use a reflect and set that the z axis and the positive connect that up here and then set this offset to say one and so now we've got kind of all all eight corners but at the same time that uh, the back ones are kind of off at a different coordinate and the front ones are at zero. And since we want to be centering things around the kind of the middle of that key of that space, I'm going to also add the shift here also to a one. I'm going to now combine that with the cube using a combine operator. So connect the box to the first input. And so now you'll notice another feature in 0.12 is these validation warnings. So when an operator doesn't have the right inputs connected or it has the wrong kind of input connected, you'll now see an error on that operator. 
So here you can say you can see required input is missing. So the combine operator has needs to have two different things to combine. So once you connect the second input here, you'll notice that that error goes away. So now I'm going to connect this combine up to the renderer. So now we've got all of our uh, the two shapes kind of combined into a single unit. And I'm going to decrease the radius on this just so we can see it a little better. And this spacing here, so that's kind of along those uh, the x and the y axes. I'm going to bump that up to 0.5 and then decrease the, the offset on this on the z-axis and the shift uh, down to 0.5. So now you've kind of got it lining up with all of the corners of that shape. Now I'm going to switch the combine mode to smooth union. And so you can already see that it's now kind of blending those two shapes together. I'm going to decrease this a little bit so you can still kind of see the cube being a well, cube. And just kind of clean things up a little bit. So, so far, this is all uh, all been using features that are avail that were available in the previous version. So we're now going to get into some of the newer features. Now that we have our shape, I'm going to add a basic material insert that between the combine and the renderer and so we now have control over the, the shading of that shape. So you'll notice on the basic material that there are two of these other inputs. Um, the first one is for shadows which is lets you change the, the different types of shadows that, that'll be used on that surface. But the one that we're looking at, we're going to be working with now, is the third one, which is the base color field. And what that does is it uses oper uh, operators connected to it to d figure out what the kind of def the base color of that shape should be at each individual point on the surface. And just to illustrate that point, I'm going to create a. Uh, it's going to create a point distance field, and what this does, this is a value field that returns um, the distance from you know wherever it's being checked to this center position here. So if we connect that up to this. We'll now notice that another of those validation things, and if you look at this, it says input does not ret support return type float, and input does not support context type context. So usually what that means is that the settings of this operator are not quite matching what this expects. And so for context, um, this is um, when you're dealing with kind of the, the shape path part of the graph, you're generally dealing with the this default context type. But when you're using when you're at a, a secondary input into a material like this, you want to switch it to material context and just connect that back up again. So now we don't have that error about the context anymore, but error about the return type, and that's because the point field is just providing a single value at each position, whereas what the material is looking for is a vector with uh, R, G, and B, and also um, an alpha part that it ignores. So to convert between those, there is the float to vector operator. So if we stick that in here, in between the two, you'll now see that it no error, and it's now started using this kind of light, this white color for most of the surface. Move that that point, that center point there. You 
you can see a little bit there that it's got a um, it's got kind of a shaded point from wherever we have that position. And so by default, the float to vector is using that first input for all four parts of the vector. And if we want to switch that to, you know, say only affect the green channel, you would take this first one to zero, take that third one, also set it to zero, and then this fourth one is ignored, but you might as well set it to zero. Um, it's ignored because uh, the basic material doesn't use it. Um, there are other operators that do use that fourth channel. So now we've got this that's only affecting the green channel. And if you want to combine that, you can now look through the field operators here going to pick a noise field. So with this noise field, I'm going to combine that to um, combine that in in this float to vector operator. And so it's not doing anything by default um, because all of the inputs are the only input it's using is the first one. But if we then switch, say the, the third part here, the Z or the blue channel, to input two, again, you get another one of the error messages. Um, the feature where it shows the warnings is not always 100% ready, so occasionally you'll kind of, uh, you won't get it like a clean error there. So you'll notice here that um, the, similar to the point distance field, this noise field also has a context field, so we need to set that to material, and then we're all set there. If you adjust the print of the scale down, and you can kind of move it around, you'll see that it is using that, uh, that first, uh, for the third channel there, um, part of the color. And if you try, so you can see for now that the position that it seems on the y-axis there, so, if you, so you kind of get those like stripes along the, the z, and that's because of the noise type that it's using. So if you switch that from simplex 2D to say simplex 3D, then you get um, kind of a different variation on all three axes. And you can kind of move it along each of those independently. So now that we've got kind of a, a basic value of vector field here being used to control the color, now to switch, to, or I'm now going to add a modulo 2D and set the axis to x and z, or z and x, and insert that between the uh, material and the renderer here. You remember from previous uh, tutorials, what the module 2D does is it pulls space along those two. It looks like it's pretty much filling everything because the size of the part that it's tiling is small enough that it fits entirely within that cube. But if you increase that up and start to see that it's now got kind of separate copies of it um, tiled out along both axes. So I'm going to bring the camera angle out so we can get a better view. And you can kind of pan around with that and see that it's repeating. It's repeating that shape kind of infinitely off in, in both. So I'm now going to try a different kind of value field as an input for that color. So we're not this one. I'm going to use a wave field. First, I'm going to set the coordinate type to 
3D because it's going to be being used in the context of a, of a 3D. And again, the context type would need to be set to material. Going to connect that to the third input here. And if we the red channel to uh, use input three. And, and I'm just going to clear out. I'm going to set all three of these um, to use it. A sine wave um, based on whatever the position is and it's applying that uh, it's easy what color it should provide. So right now it's set to just do it along the x-axis. Um, if you switch it to you know, z you can see it's kind of using that um, axis. Now, if you increase the years, that'll be like the spacing of the or the length of um, the phase here. So you'll notice that things get kind of point, and that's because the the wave field going from positive one to negative one. So those values are kind of too large. So I'm going to, I'm going to increase, decrease the amplitude down to, say, like 0.4, and then off, set the offset a little bit higher. So it's now, now going high and up a little bit tighter of a range. Decrease the period. Um, you can kind of see, um, see the, the repetition of the pattern a little bit better. You'll notice that as I shift the, if I, as I shift it around, the color that it's using on each one of these is kind of it's the same pattern on every one, and that's because it's using what's called local positioning in the material. So, so in material, there's this toggle now for e whether to use local position. So if you switch that off. It's now using kind of the whole the position of that shape uh, within the the world as a whole. So if you stretch it out here, you can see that you're kind of moving along um, the whole space instead of just kind of scoped to that one um, shape. And so it's kind of it's it's using the two D to kind of repeat space, but it's it's using the position um, to pick up the color. So if you want it to use the position kind of before anything that comes further down the line, you would use the local position here. Now that we've got our uh, pattern showing up on the I'm going to split uh, a texture field. So first step is to create a texture and, and to again set the material the context type to material. It's already using 3D coordinates and hook. And here you'll notice that input does not support return type vectors that this thing yields that only return a single uh, float value when this thing is returning a full VA, uh, vector. So you don't actually need the float vector in this case. So you can just correct, connect that directly up there. And right now there isn't a, a texture set up onto it, but if you create a, say, a movie file in and add a null on the end there, and then drag this into the texture field here. You now see that it's using that texture on the surface of the shape. And right now it's using it along the x and the y axes. If you switch it to x and z, um, then it'll kind of be on the top of the and, and the bottom of the shape there. Now these the scale and translate parameters will let you kind of move that 
uh, move the texture around. And you'll notice here that when things, because it's only using uh, the X and the Z color at every point along the Y axis, if you were to kind of extrude the shape along the Z axis, sometimes that's something you want to avoid, but it is something to be aware of. There's also an And this is kind of, this is equivalent to the setting that's in a lot of tops for how to extend values outside the normal range. So I'm going to switch that back to zero. So it's just going to use zero for areas that are outside that range. And I'm going to switch to, I'm going to create a, a ramp, set it to circular. And I'm going to create a circle and hook it up there, and then set the mode here, multiply. So what that's going to do is it's going to kind of mask out the areas that are outside the circle, um, which lets you kind of avoid issues with like the texture kind of having a, a square shape. Um, I'll show you what that means in a second. So here. If you bypass this there, you can see that it's kind of using the texture as like a, a square region of space. And this circle here is kind of lets you map the corners. So I'm going to in decrease the period here so that you get kind of a um, ring. And then adjust the, the, the points on the on the um, ramp so that we get kind of a tighter pattern. So that gets us you that gets us these this kind of ring pattern. And you can then play around with the phase setting here and it will animate that. And so to do that I'm gonna create a constant chop. Uh, set the name here to phase, add a speed chop at the end here, and then add a null to the end, and then drag this phase channel onto phase here, and set the, the speed so now it will just kind of continually animate that and without and the, the circle here is kind of masking out the corners so that you don't get that um, effect as the pattern um, reaches out to the edge there so i'm going to clean up um, those uh, value fields there that we aren't using anymore since we're now just using this one texture field. Now this texture field, as you'll note, is kind of only working along two axes. It's only using the x and the z axes. Um, you can switch that to a different axis, like say the y and the z, and you'll see now it's kind of using those two. Um, you know, or X and Y and so on, um, but it's only going to do one axis at a time. So one option would be to use three of these and set one to Y, set one to ZX, set the other one to Y and Z, and then add them all together or something. But there is a shortcut for that approach, planar texture field. And 
This one has similar parameters to our planner uh, texture field here. But it, it and if you set the texture there right, and connect this up here, see so we'll now notice that it is applying the original three axes. So right now it's um, if you can kind of move it along in, in three axes like that. It's using. It's currently using um, what's called normal blending mode, which uses the direction that a uh, point on the surface is based on how much to use. And for things like a sphere, so swap out, swap in a sphere here. So you can see there how it is kind of blending the two as the point is normal it goes from pointing along the one axis to another axis. It kind of two textures, and, and so I'm going to switch back, back to shape. Get rid of that. And so right now is using a single texture source for all three axes, um, and that's um, that's often used. There is also an option to use a different one for. It. So what we're gonna do here make kind of three variations of this. I'm gonna use a constant and set the output mode uh, to comp with input. And so you can see it's kind of applying that orange tint. And do something similar for say, green and purple. Um, so you've now got three different variants there. And on the tri point texture field, there is the so instead of just specifying one texture, you now have three different ones that you can provide. So setting the x axis, the y axis, and then the z axis, um, which may be swapped. So you have different texture source being applied on each axis, and then that shape is kind of being repeated off infinitely along the grid like that. So just to summarize what we have so far, we have a box SDF um, being combined with a sphere that has been um, split and mirrored using like mirror octant along the x and the y axes and then reflected and shifted along the z-axis to get us this, to get us this, uh, you know, four copies of it on each corner there. And blending those with a smooth union here. So if you play around with that uh, blend radius, and then that's going into a basic material, which is using this triplanar texture field to affect the base color of uh, points on the surface and it's using three different texture sources uh, one for each axis and applying those kind of along um, along those axes like based on whether the surface direction is pointing in that direction that's then going into a modulo 2d which is repeat kind of tiling space um, along the uh, x and that's going into a render. Which notes on the basic material, this is using local positioning. Um, if we were to switch this off, you can see that it's kind of using, it's only using kind of an 
global position um, af after this modulo 2t has been applied. So if you shift things around, you can see that it kind of the texture stays in the same place, but even if the shapes are moving. And if we switch, go back to local positioning there and then try that again, um, you'll see that it moves along with the shape because this is kind of coming after that in the chain. Now that we have our infinite um, with that texture being applied to them, I'd also like to get some more interesting patterns of motion in there. So I'm going to create a rotate and insert that between the two here, between the uh, material and the modulo 2D. And so we can now rotate those shapes. And you'll notice that because this is kind of coming later in the chain than the material, and that material is using local positioning, the texture kind of follows that rotation. Um, so what I'd like to do here is have it kind of alternate flipping in each direction. So we're going to start with an LFO chop, and then set that to pulse. And then if we can see down to 0.5, I'm going to add a count at the end of it. And so that's going to be kind of counting um, every time that that pulse happens. And because there are only three axes that we care about in the count settings here, I'm going to turn on limit to uh, loop and set the limit down there. And you'll notice that when you change the limit um, in a in a count thing, sometimes the, the values get scaled down, so you end up with these fractional numbers. So just remember to reset it there. So now you've got a counter that's going between 0 and 3, which is actually not what we want. We want to go 0 and 2. And so now kind of toggling between those three numbers, I'm going to use a fan after it, and what this is going, to, what this is doing is it switches on a different channel um, depending on what that value is. So we only need three of these, and we're going to call R, X, Y, and Z. So it's now kind of toggling between those, and I'm going to create another count after this. So now you've got a counter that's going kind of separately on each axis like that. And after that, I'm going to add a math. Um, so instead of going just, you know, up by one each time, I'm going to have it do it things in multiples of 90. So a you know, full um, right angle rotation, and then add a lag at the end, which is going to kind of smooth out the, um, the transition between the values as it, as it changes there, and then add a null on the end here. And then in the rotate, I'm going to use each of these settings here, so drag that in and use chop reference, same thing for Y, and then same thing for Z. And you can already see that it's now using that flipping pattern on the axes. And we're now getting some kind of a little bit strange behavior there with the triplanar texture field. So uh, it's, it's a relatively new operator, so there are some kind of uh, rough edges that need to be ironed out. But I think the problem here caused by the, the blending mode, instead of using the normal blending where you get that kind of thing between the axes, I'm just going to use the axis maximum, 
So now when it's combining them, it's just going to use the maximum value for each one along that axis. And if you were to scale this up, so it's stretching there, you can see that it's combining the three channels. And the reason that we don't have it kind of showing up on the sides like that is because it's scaled down small, never reaches those sides. And uh, it's using an extend mode of zero here. So if you sort of set this to say like repeat, then and scaled it down there, you would get kind of a different pattern there. But I'm going to go back to just 0 and scale of 1. So what I'm going to do here is uh, vary those. So in the module load 2D, there's the error type setting. So with this stuff flips every other uh, every other cell along both axes. And so you'll notice that because of the way that it's um, splitting things, um, it kind of by default puts the um, split, it, shift, it kind of shifts the, the position of where it's um, splitting space. So what you generally need to do with that is use this offset here. So if we were go back to say like 2 and then set the off to down to negative 1 so now space things out a little bit more appropriately so kind of uh, way to automate that a little bit it is to expression here so you would say you know me dot par dot size 1 divided by 2 or negative me dot par divided by um, two. And then same thing in this other one, and then switch, swap in um, size 2 for that. As you increase this, it will kind of adjust the offset to, to match. So alternating pattern, and because it's splitting space, Kind of along those axes you can get this kind of interesting effect here with these with some of them that are along the corners where it's kind of splitting and reflecting along a plane along a diagonal plane there so this is kind of one way to um, instances of well not instances but very very kind of copies of a shape along along a um, along. So, so the other technique is called iteration.